to squad execute door breach. Yes, sir. On our way. Commencing door breach maneuver. Keep me covered. Roger that. Stand back. Firing the hole! E3 2004, a new game is unveiled, a mature, gory, tactical squad based shooter for the original Xbox. Selected to offer the Microsoft console a game that can rival the Tom Clancy games and compare to the first party Halo series. And it's a Star Wars game? This is Star Wars Republic Commando 16 years later. Star Wars isn't exactly the first franchise one thinks of when imagining a hardcore, mature first person shooter, but it's this exact stereotype a small internal team at LucasArts was trying to tear down. Before the release of the Star Wars prequels starting in 1999, LucasArts created all kinds of games, not just limiting themselves to their namesake's most famous invention. But when they did make Star Wars games, they made them as passion projects. Unique games dreamt up by developers to tackle new gameplay ideas, aiming to advance and even create their own genres. The Star Wars universe was simply an established backdrop to original video game premises that would have been interesting in their own right. Titles such as the TIE Fighter and X-Wing series to the Kyle Katarn saga of action adventure shooters all were praised for being good games, regardless of their association to that multi-million dollar franchise. But with the prequels soon to be released, Production at LucasArts instead began to shift towards checking boxes to release as many Star Wars related products as they could and in as many genres as existed. While this strategy did result in many well received games, with some even finding themselves with a cult status of their own, it also resulted in just as many generic, mediocre titles. As the prequel movies ran their course, LucasArts continued to produce a slew of Star Wars games as well as commissioning third party companies to create their own, from Pandemic's Battlefront series to Bioware's Knights of the Old Republic. As LucasArts leaned more and more heavily on its Star Wars brand, the quality slowly dropped over time, with reviews shifting from positive to bang average. While these average titles were for the most part received well by fans, with sales numbers remaining strong, a decline was still seen. With Attack of the Clones just released in cinemas in early 2002, one of the internal teams at LucasArts found inspiration in the newly introduced clone armies. These clones were a blank canvas, an empty foundation with little lore tied to them, giving an ambitious team the perfect springboard to invent their own story. They aimed to give personality and life to the clones, an otherwise generic and genetically identical individual years before the Clone Wars TV show would attempt the same concept. The team wanted to create a game that even without any of Star Wars' main features from the Jedi and Sith to the Force and lightsabers, was still able to capture a fan's imagination and hearts. Until this point, many of the post Phantom Menace games had stayed close to the fantastical elements of the space opera, with a clear child friendly and whimsical theme to many of them. This was one of the main motifs the team immediately wanted to avoid, instead looking to create a grittier and more grounded ethos for their game. During this conceptual period of development, the newly popular Tom Clancy games were making a name for themselves, namely Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon. The team wanted to see if they could place the same first person tactical shooter with its sense of lethality, top of the line training and military camaraderie into George Lucas's fantasy universe. This was at the beginning of the gritty era of gaming from the mid 2000s into the early 2010s where Goliath series like Call of Duty would find their new calling with games such as Modern Warfare. If the 2000s could be described with three words, they would be dark and gritty. 
And while many a university essay may argue for the reasons behind this, whether it be the 9-11 disaster destroying America's sense of invulnerability, or the Iraq wars and the troubles in the Middle East birthing a new era of rebellious teenagers, whatever it may have been, it is clear from films such as Black Hawk Down and Jawhead, popular music being dominated by a neo-punk era of emo and metal music with bands like System of the Down, and the switches in video games like the aforementioned Call of Duty series, all forms of media were changing from the colourful feel of the 90s to the browns, greys and greens of the 2000s. Concept artist Greg Knight too took clear influence from this while designing the world of Republic Commando. From a making of video included in the game, Knight stated that he imagined that if the movies were seen from the lofty perspective of the Jedi, then what might the same universe look like as seen from the battle-hardened eyes of a soldier? The result was a darker and grittier interpretation of the otherwise familiar Star Wars elements. The influence can be further seen in the soundtrack, with the main theme song, Vod An, taking on a faster pace, grittier and more vocal tone, a clear departure from John Williams' iconic score. Composer Jesse Harlan stated that the entire goal was to present a dark and military take on the Star Wars universe from the point of view of disposable grunts, something no one had seen before, again referencing how Lucas's films followed the perspective of the all-powerful Jedi. Harlan said, Most of John Williams' material is very romantic and theoretically relates to the characters we weren't focusing on. This change of viewpoint from the religious Jedi to the war-ready clones is further emphasised with the vocal melody within the Vodan track, with the core lyrics having been written in an early version of the Mandalorian language, a callback to the genetic and cultural heritage of every clone soldier. When designing the Commando clone troopers, Greg Knight took inspiration from warriors of our own human history, including Roman gladiators, ninjas and US Navy SEALs. And while Knight would never admit this himself, I think it's clear that some influence was taken from fellow Xbox icon Halo's Master Chief, with the bulkier and more rugged looking armour being an inspiration. Later in the development cycle, it was actually creator George Lucas who would recommend adding individual colours to the troopers to help distinguish them, in part to capitalise on visual elements he was exploring for Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, and later in the animated Clone Wars television series. Lucas also asked the team to introduce unique personalities and voices for the squad members, which threw a large spanner into development at the time, with many voice lines having to be re-recorded by new cast members. While Tamura Morrison was slated to voice every member originally, by the game's release he was instead only voicing the playable character, RC-1138, designation Boss. Colour, tone, ethics, a sense of grandiose space and realism. These were the main features the concept artists tried to capture when designing the visual themes behind Star Wars Republic Commando. When developing the gameplay, the team took careful consideration when devising the tactical-based strategy elements. Their inspirations, such as Tom Clancy games, relied heavily on micromanagement, a style of gameplay the team worried would not translate well for many Star Wars fans. This problem was solved via the streamlined single-button method of team control. Instead of having to worry about addressing individual complex orders to your AI teammates, each action can be quickly made through broad directives sent to the squad by aiming at a specific hand-placed element in the level, such as a terminal that needs to be hacked or a door that can be breached. And as a reminder that this was a high-budget first-party game, the animation and gameplay teams actually took advice from Special Forces instructors to help bolster and cement a realistic tactical military feel. As production began to come to a head, LucasArts, in the face of declining sales and mediocre review scores, decided to appoint a new president to help address the studio's fall from grace. Upon taking the job, Jim Ward quickly began to axe project after project in a bid to cut costs and remove games he personally didn't believe in. Republic Commando was one of the titles that Ward didn't understand the appeal of, but due to its late stage of production and Lucas' interest in the project, the game was spared. However, the game was deliberately under-marketed, with Ward instead saving the marketing capital to further finance the success of Battlefront 2, which was slated to release later that year. Despite these setbacks, after nearly three full years of development, Star Wars Republic Commando finally hit store shelves on February 28, 2005 for the original Xbox.
Our story begins with the playable character, a clone designated as RC1138, being born, or uh, created, in a Kamino Bacta tank. We watch the main character grow up through his eyes, while a Kamino cloner monologues about how we're essentially God's gift to all clone troopers. RC1138, who will come to be known as Boss, is still technically a copy-paste of Django Fett, but they've messed with his genes a little to make him the best of the best. Think the Bad Batch, but more like the Good Batch. This sets the unique theme for the game. Before Republic Commando was released, all fans knew of the clones was that they were a nameless horde of white armoured soldiers, with seemingly little special about any individual member of the army. So in this intro, not only have we learned that the clones have their own personalities, but some are inherently better than others. It's interesting to see the birth of the ideas that Lucas would continue to develop in the Clone Wars series and later Dave Filoni would explore to an even closer degree in the new Bad Bat series. We're given our new armour and are introduced to our permanent heads up display, evidently inspired by the Metroid Prime series, with the corners of the helmet visor being always visible, adding to the immersion that you are a clone trooper clad in your armour. It also has a set of built-in features, from night vision to even a built-in electronic windscreen wiper. Yeah, you're gonna be needing it. The devs were clearly interested in seeing just how far they could push that T rating. In February 2005, this was the goriest Star Wars had ever been. Well, until just about three months later. We're briefly introduced to our fellow genetically superior clone brothers, and without much fanfare, the squad soon splits up upon their departure from Coruscant, and we head to Geonosis, the very first battle of the Clone Wars. Your first objective is to find him and link up. The squad objective remains. Find Sun Fak and eliminate him. I will be issuing further orders as you go. Good luck, Commando. This game is about the men on the ground doing the hard work. Without the operatic spectacle of the magically powered space wizards of the Jedi and the Sith, and that becomes apparent as we swoop into an active war zone on Geonosis. We drop in and find ourselves with our first two weapons an infinite ammo recharging pistol to fall back onto, and our meat and potatoes a fully automatic Republic laser rifle. Both of which are very reminiscent of that other first party Xbox game especially with the large circle crosshair, which only gives the general idea of where you're shooting at. In a cool move, the rifle actually forms the basis of the other two standard clone commando weapons, with attachments allowing the rifle to transform into either a grenade launcher or a sniper rifle. An anti-armor attachment. This should come in handy against all these droids. And damn, do these weapon switch animations look good. Autobots, roll out! There are other weapons you can pick up too. These are generally specialty firearms that are individual to the specific faction you are currently battling, like this Geonosian beam rifle or a Trandoshan shotgun. Unfortunately, you can only pick up one third party weapon at a time, forcing you to choose between the awesome Trandoshan and Wookiee weapons. I would gladly give up my underpowered pistol for any of these. The full arsenal isn't groundbreaking, but every hole you would expect has been filled the main complaint with these weapons, however, is just how weak they feel. Your main assault rifle is particularly feeble, whether it's the generic laser sound effect, the complete lack of any punch in the animations, or the fact that it seemingly takes 10 shots to take down the weakest of enemies, you constantly feel underpowered even on the lower difficulties. This decision was probably made to further emphasise the importance of your squad, but it comes at the expense of making everything feel like a bullet sponge. To counterpoint this, in some instances, this bullet sponginess is actually an advantage when fighting some enemies. The super battle droids in particular feel especially badass, acting as a real threat to the player in relation to their tin can B1 brethren. They live up to their imposing stature, unlike how disposable they would be in Battlefront 2. To round out your offensive options, there are a variety of grenades with each type being useful in differing scenarios. The EMP grenades are notably effective when fighting droids, helping to even the odds against some of the more advanced robotic opponents. When it comes to close quarters, your best bet is to simply stab the bad guy with your Assassin's Creed wrist blade. Interestingly, this in fact came out two years before that series even began. 
While getting into melee may seem risky, when your main weapon amounts to a space pea shooter, it is often the wiser decision to go with. It's undoubtedly the most stylish. The weapon the game really wants you to utilise is Delta Squad itself. That was literally the marketing angle the game went with. You can choose between four formations for traversing the level, each change in how the AI moves akin to the player and how they react to enemies. You can also give direct orders for your squad to follow, with the most useful being to make them target one specific enemy, such as the variety of mini-boss enemies each faction possesses. You can position squad members to take up an array of offensive positions, such as a sniper perch or on a turret, but for the most part, these positions act as areas of cover you place the AI behind to best stop the swarms of droids, bugs and lizards sent your way. And you'll be needing to do this often. The AI, when left alone, is a bit lacklustre. It's clear that they are absent of any sense of self-preservation, and without the player's involvement, they can quickly die. There are lots of situations where you'll be the one doing all the fighting while you task your squad to focus on the objectives, because if you choose to do the alternative, you will soon notice that without your aid, they rarely perform like the elite commandos they claim to be, regularly missing shots and failing to take down enemies that shouldn't be too much of a hassle for them. While this squad system is very streamlined, all being condensed down to just one button, it can at times feel like LucasArts may have gone too far in their mission to boil down the tactical shooter genre and may have even removed the tactical aspect altogether. The main proof of this is that for the most part, you can do everything yourself, removing the need for any of these commandos to even have the unique specialist roles they were introduced with. The playable character is seemingly so skilled at sniping, hacking and demolitions that it makes you question why we needed Sev, Fixer and Scorch respectively to even have these stereotypical roles. It makes the whole elite squad dynamic from a gameplay standpoint feel a bit redundant when each member is their own one-man army. But where it all starts to make sense is with the story and the dialogue that accompanies Delta Squad. Their main purpose is to drive the narrative forward and help to give personality to an otherwise drab army of identical beings, at least during their introduction into the series. The banter between the team feels very natural and the voice actors do a great job of embodying their respective stereotypes. Seb, how many kills you got today, Psycho? With a new boy, Scotty. Keep this calm clear, you two. Calm down, Fixer. Just having a little fun. <sighs> Your character, Boss, the only member to be voiced by Django Fett's on-screen actor, Tamura Morrison, has some notably good one-liners, making you feel like you're part of your own Schwarzenegger movie. Hmm, an energy weapon that looks like a slug thrower. I didn't think lizards were that nostalgic. Throughout the game, you will grow to love these guys and their quick quips to every situation. Let's rearrange some architecture, Deltas. I'm on it. Wait, red, red, green, or red, green, red? And he's supposed to be the demolition expert. The developers must have known this, hence why the story and particularly the ending were written the way they were. Overall, this is a very likeable team. While I won't delve too deep into the story to avoid spoilers, there isn't really much to say. It was left with a cliffhanger to set up for a sequel, and in the infinite wisdom of LucasArts' then new president, the idea was quickly nipped in the bud, never to see the light of day. At least Dave Filoni made the Commandos canon in the Clone Wars before Disney could swoop in and nuke them out of existence. But that still doesn't fill the hole left by this game's ending. Back to Geonosis, and we find that you don't start the game with your full squad immediately, instead being introduced to each member throughout the introductory tutorial mission. When you do finally conglomerate the squad and you're moving as a methodical foursome of death, the game begins to really come together. The sense of scale of the Battlefront series is great, but the armies always felt disjointed, too widely spread and quite dumb from an AI standpoint. Republic Commando is the antithesis to this. Delta Squad feel like a tight, well-oiled machine, really grounding the war scenarios of this game in reality. The tactical system may be basic, but the fact it works so well in the moment is a testament to this game's premise. Being able to quickly order your team into their positions while you battle the next threat thrown your way is epic. This leads to the ballsiest move in this game, which is the removal of a fail state. For the most part, instead of the death of the player being the end of your play session, the entirety of the squad must fall to lose the game. This means the AI can actually revive you, which they always do in a timely manner. I can't say how technically advanced this friendly AI is, but it mostly works how it's supposed to. 
I'm not sure if it's a bug or not, but there are a few times where it feels like the AI has no sense of urgency when being given these orders however. Squad members can react to orders slowly, especially when ordering them to focus on heavy enemy types. This is very apparent when battling the Geonosian elites, who will be able to consistently melt your teammates with its beam rifle. But overall, for a streamlined console shooter, Republic Commando lives up to that tagline. There will be some times where you have to play certain parts of a level on your own, and these always feel gimped from the full squad experience, making you realise just how much you actually rely on them for the gameplay to feel complete. These sequences without your squad also fully highlight how dull and spongy the combat is without them. Much like Half-Life, your health can only be recovered by plugging into these conveniently placed back to tank machines. You can also direct your squad to use these when they're at a low health. And believe me, you will be doing this a lot to make sure your men stay healthy. While this isn't as modern as the Call of Duty style Wolverine healing, it never feels too difficult to find these machines, with them always being placed before or after any kind of big fight arena. And sometimes they're even available during a combat scenario, allowing you to juggle fighting and healing in some of the longer lasting encounters. This is one of the only areas of the tactical squad system that can feel a bit micromanagey with Delta Squad rarely having their own self-preservation in mind, and instead relying on your permission to heal themselves up. After Geonosis, we have to fight some space pirates who have taken over a Republic ship. These Trandoshans fight differently from the droids and bugs from the first campaign, and bring a ton of unique weaponry with them, making this campaign feel different from Geonosis, and not just because of the scenery. The concept artists said they wanted the Trandoshan guns to feel powerful but primitively engineered, and they doubtlessly nailed that feeling. This is the closest we will ever get to playing Doom in the Star Wars universe. Shotguns, chain guns, rocket launchers, they have it all. So far, the game is moving at a great pace, and there's a nice amount of variety in the gameplay, but then Kiadi Mundi comes in to ruin our parade. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? Republic Commando was taken so long to make after Episode 2 that the new predicted launch for the game was in 2005, just months before Lucas's final live action Star Wars was set to release. With delays happening, in part due to Lucas suddenly introducing the unique Delta Squad personalities, a decision was made to capitalise on this delay and tie the game in with the new movie, with marketing slating the game as a prequel to the upcoming film. And so, it's off to Kashyyyk we go. It's not only the droids that have bulked up for this game, the Wookiees here are certainly interesting. <laughs> At least they still look better than the ones in Fallen Order. What is that? What the fuck is that? The new Wookiee weapons and the various set pieces are on par with the rest of the game, but with each encounter, they all start to feel more and more like filler to pad out the ending. With the final campaign feeling obnoxiously long compared to the two before it, each one before this rounded out nicely to about two hours long but I found myself slogging through a seemingly endless amount of Wookiee hangers for nearly 4 hours, and we are solely fighting droids too, with the only new enemy type being Grievous' bodyguards. While the game does lose an ounce of polish in its last missions, it is still an overall great experience and an entirely unique take on Star Wars. It made the universe feel so grounded and real, with the mortality of the clones genuinely hitting hard, LucasArts actually tried to make the droids feel like an ominous threat that required a powerful army to defeat, which makes how dumbed down they became in the Star Wars series even more hilarious in retrospect. Imagine struggling to fight these. RB551. No wonder he got blasted. He's one of those older models programmed by a central computer. Not us. We're independent thinkers. Roger, 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 Roger. Instead of these. <laughs> Super battle droids. Concentrate your squad's fire on single targets to penetrate their armor. And then there's the multiplayer. Yeah, it's dead now, sadly. You sometimes see attempts at revivals on Reddit or on modern websites, but I haven't had any luck. Reviewers at the time didn't seem too impressed, stating that the mode was very simple, but from what I've seen, it played very similarly to Halo 2, 
And if that's true, it's a damn shame we aren't able to enjoy some multiplayer Star Wars gunfights in Republic Commando anymore. Republic Commando was one of the many games from that time that were made for the original Xbox and then backported to the PC. This method usually came with some oddities, and in this case, it's the mouse sensitivity. The mouse cursor is crazy fast on the menus. None of the vanilla settings in this game help. This appears to be linked to the high frames per second, so you could try manually limiting it yourself. But I find just downloading a mod is easier. I'll put a link in the description for the one that I'm using. This mod also fixes all the other port issues, like the stretched widescreen resolution, giving you the option to run the game as high as 4K. With the compatibility issue out of the way, let's discuss the graphics. For 2005, it looks great. It wasn't groundbreaking for its time, but it's pushing what was possible for the Xbox and is on par with the Halo games in my opinion. There's some great modelling on the Delta Squad members and the explosions and particle effects look good even today. Sure, the unique art style helps with this, but the graphics remain proficient in a technical sense. However, in 2005, Bloom was seen as God's gift to graphics, and if you've ever played Oblivion, then you will know that good old Toddy believed this with all his heart. Because of this, some elements can look blown out, and the darker areas can be a bit too dark. If you're playing on PC, I recommend turning this off in the settings. The game runs on the Unreal 2 engine, the exact same engine that would become the basis for many Call of Duty games in the future, so you can expect the same fluidity here. The game feels exceptionally smooth and responsive. In terms of performance, the game should run well on even an outdated PC. It's a mid-2000s game on the Unreal engine, so you really shouldn't encounter too many issues in getting this game to run well, with exceptionally high frame rates. It's just a shame that you have to limit the FPS to not break boss's neck with every flick of the mouse. A recent port from Aspire has hit the PS4, Xbox One and Nintendo Switch, and while this didn't come with any form of an upgrade, being an Unreal Engine game, it still looks pretty good, just don't go buying a new console release expecting anything better than what is offered by the comparatively cheaper PC version. The sound design is as good as one would expect from a first party LucasArts game. John Williams' signature score is here, as well as many sound effects ripped straight from the movies. Unique new sound effects add a lot to the game too, such as the creepy clicking insect-like legs on the side of the Geonosian Elite Beam Rifle, which speed up when the gun is firing, and just listen to how powerful and bassy that orange plasma is. Oh, they got fixer. Hold on. A brand new original soundtrack from Jesse Harlan accompanies and complements Williams' music, adding a darker tone that lends itself well to the atmosphere of the game. LucasArts has always been at the forefront of gaming graphics and audio in my opinion, and Republic Commando is no exception. It simply oozes quality and high production values. This is a must play for any Star Wars fans. Overall, it has aged pretty well, better than it had any right to, and it's a testament to the Unreal Engine's longevity in gaming. While the game only garnered decent reviews at the time, it has built a very strong cult following over the past decade. Nostalgia is definitely a part of that cult status, but the premise is so solid that a well-made sequel could really capitalise on the mechanics introduced here. And if you're watching this video because of that nostalgia, it's honestly worth going back to. It may be lacking for the non-Star Wars fans out there, especially between its streamlined mechanics and bullet sponge enemies however, and it's a shame about the cliffhanger story arc and the now abandoned multiplayer. Even with these issues though, Star Wars Republic Commando is, in my opinion, one of the best Star Wars games, definitely in the top 10 for many. Go check it out if you haven't before, and if you're returning back to this classic, good luck to you soldier. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please leave the video a like and comment below your thoughts, and subscribe for more retrospective content on classic games. Thank you for 430 subscribers, and I'll see you in the next one.